So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The following is a discussion I have uh, on the issue of the last days and miracles, how they're interrelated, and how we should uh, be open to this, especially in the last days. But after that, I have a discussion about how to think about things from an Islamic perspective. That talk is just as important, inshallah. So I just wanted to let you know there's one talk, which is about 45 minutes, and then the second talk, which is just as important, if not more important. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ahmaduhu wa usalli ala rasulil kareem, amma ba'd fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanallahi asra bi abdihi layla min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassil li amri wa ahlu al-uqdata min lisani yafkahu qawli. اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وزقنا طبا وأرنا الباطل باطلا وزقنا اجتنابا آمين يا رب. I want to approach the subject uh, from different perspectives. The first thing I want to share with you is that this part of the Quran that is right at the center where Surah Al-Kahf is, as you know, the very central word within the whole of Qur'an is also in Surah Al-Kahf. So be careful or be vigilant and let not people become aware of who you are, this verse of the Qur'an in Surah Al-Kahf. And also the other meaning of the same verse, وَلْيَتَلَطَّفْ uh, be nice, be gentle, be latif, and وَلَا يُشْئِرَنَّ بِكُمْ أَحَدَ Be gentle and don't let other people figure out who you are. إِنْ يَذْهَرُوا عَلَيْهِمْ If you become apparent to them, if it becomes obvious to them who you are, يَرْجُمُوكُمْ أَوْ يُعِيدُوكُمْ فِي مِلَّتِهِمْ وَلَنْ تُفْلِهُ إِذًا أَبَدًا They will stone you to death or force you back and then you will never be successful. So this is at the very center of the Quran. And uh, this very center is where Surah Al-Kahf is, because Surah Al-Kahf, as you know, is generally what they call the 15th Juz is in the center. And then the Surah before it and the Surah after it are attached to this Surah. As those people who took my Arabic class, I one of the things I pounded on them was the relationship between Surah Al-Bani Israel and Surah Al-Kahf because Surah Al-Bani Israel, the surah before, starts with Subhanallah the Asra, Subhanallah the Asra bi Abdihi, that all perfection to Allah is the one who took his Abd, his slave into the heavens. And Surah Al-Kahf is Alhamdulillah Alladhi Anzala Ala Abdi Al-Kitab. All praises for Allah who brought down the book on his servant. So this relationship of going up, Subhanallah the Asra bi Abdihi, Alhamdulillah Alladhi Anzala Ala Abdihi. I'll even show this to you in a second, but let me just mention what I'm saying first. So this relationship between perfection is the one who took his servant up and all praises for Allah, the one who took his, took, brought the book down. So these two surahs, they are, you know, like a pair. And I've talked about the pairing of the surahs of Quran before. If you haven't heard me talk about it before, just I'll give you one example. Most of the surahs in Quran, they are in pairs, like Falak and Nas, like Baqarah and Al Imran. And like Fatiha in the whole of Quran, like this. And uh, so, anyway, so Sutul Kahf and Sutul Bani Israel are like a pair. Then Sutul Bani Israel ends with Kulil Alhamdulillah, say Alhamdulillah, and then Sutul Kahf starts with Alhamdulillah. So, this I've taught before. What I want to teach different today, this is also the part of the Quran that lays the greatest emphasis on miracles. Why is this important? Because Surah Al-Kahf is the surah of end times. Okay, It's one of the surahs. There are other surahs that are related to the end times also. But Surah Al-Kahf is one of the major surahs 
that is really, really dedicated to what? To the end times. And what does Surah Al-Kahf do? Surah Al-Kahf tells you about miracles of even the non-prophets. Okay? So you have the whole of Quran showing you miracles of Musa, the miracles of different prophets, but Surah Al-Kahf will give you the miracles of what? Of the non-prophets. Okay? And so the Ashab Al-Kahf, they were not prophets and they slept for 300 years. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported Allah's support for the non-prophets. Okay? So this becomes very important part of the Allah is telling us that yes, I will give miracles even to the non-prophets. One of the things that has happened, let me go through Sutul Kahf and then I will tell you one of the tragedies that's happened in, because of the modern times and because of the Dijali Fitna, uh, which is essentially that we no longer believe miracles can happen to me and you, you see? And this is a very big mistake uh, consciously in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Sutul Kahf starts off with the seven sleepers and how so many miraculous things happened with them, right? They went to sleep and then they had the dog protecting them. And then their encounter with uh, the people uh, when they woke up and then going back to sleep, okay? And uh, then you have uh, you have the man with the uh, garden, okay? And he has a, re a relationship with this other man according to some narrations, his brother, it doesn't matter, but he has a relationship with this other man who was pious and he says, maybe Allah will destroy your garden and the next thing you know, his garden is destroyed. And, um, and so that also will happen. Okay, and then um, the third one is Musa and Khidr. Again, here is a man, see it's very strange that it's been put right here in the center that right here in Sutul Kahf, this man that is teaching Musa is not a prophet, Khidr so you have a greater uh, teacher, a great uh, like the person who is of higher rank being taught by somebody who is in a lower rank and he's doing miracles that even, you know it's one thing to be taught but he's doing mir something miraculous and the prophet of Allah who talks directly to Allah is not understanding the miracles and is being done by uh, a uh, somebody not at the level of Musa In Sharia, we all agree that Musa has the higher position compared to Khidr because he's the Rasul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Musa has a higher position with Allah. He's closer to Allah than Khidr. But the miracles are being done by the hands of Khidr. And so the same will be here. Even though there will be people in the Ummah in the past that have much higher position than uh, you can say some of the other believers, but Allah will be using them for his purposes. Then you know Zul Qarnain, of course, he's doing something uh, very miraculous. And not only is he doing something miraculous, he's, uh, you know, so anyway, so he's, you know, he's, doing something miraculous is that he's putting in and I'll be talking more about this in the coming days but the wall that he builds and how he knows where to go and how to treat people and then he can't understand the people but he still understands them meaning the Quran says there were people they couldn't understand but he's still able to communicate with them and he's still able to enforce the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on them so then okay so Sutul so Kahf is clear that it is dealing with the miracles of who? Sutul so Kahf is clear it is dealing with the miracles of the non-prophets. Okay. And so this is Sutul so Kahf, okay, dealing with the uh, the miracles of the non-prophets. Now, the surah right before this, as I mentioned earlier, is Sutul so Isra or Sutul so Bani Israel. Right now, Stulbani Israel is the greatest miracle given to any prophet. Not in the normal sense of the word that you can see it, but 
actually understand that it is. Okay. And that is the Isra wal Miraj. It is the greatest gift and miracle given to any Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So right, so you have all the miracles of Sutul Kahf, okay? And then you have right before that the greatest miracle that has ever happened to any Prophet, which was specifically uh, the case of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. And just as in our Ummah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Prophet Isa Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, they have a relationship. So what happens? The greatest miracle is here, Sutul Isra. Then over here, the next surah, uh, the next surah after that, Sutul Kahf, Gives you the pro the miracles of non prophets, okay. And then, after Sutul Kahf is which surah? Sutul Maryam. And Sutul Maryam gives you the greatest miracle of all the prophets before the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The man who is miracle, the man who who's birth, whose death, whose walking, whose breathing, whose everything is miraculous, completely miraculous, and that is Nabi Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Okay? And so the so you have the greatest miracle, Sutul Isra, and I've already talked about the relationship many times between Sutul Isra and Sutul Kahf, how they're tied into one another. But over here also notice what? I want to just so then now at the level of these three surahs, I want to show you the relationship also. One of the major topics, you know, the beginning and the endings of the surahs are extremely important. Okay. And so now Surah Al-Isra ends with what? Let me show you. Surah Al-Isra ends with number one, ayah number 111. Okay, so Tul Kaf has a many, how many ayahs? 110. So just keep this in mind. So Tul Isra ends with Kul alhamdulillah illadhi, Kul alhamdulillah. Say alhamdulillah. So the next surah starts with alhamdulillah. Kul alhamdulillah illadhi lam yattakhid walad. Allah will, Allah will not take for himself a son. Walam yakul lahu sharikun fil mulk. And Allah will not accept in his kingdom any partners. This is Allah's earth, okay? Allah's universe. He's Rabbul Alameen. He's not going to take any partners, okay? Nor does he make any friends out of weaknesses. Allah doesn't take friends. Allah makes friends. Ashabul Kahf were his friends. Sulkarnain was his friend. The man in the garden was his friend. These were his friends. But Allah doesn't take make friends and make his walis out of weakness. No. But he has walis. And give takbir to your Rabb. Okay. Then you have what? Allah doesn't take any sons. And then in Sutul Kahf, the next surah you have in the ending, okay, in the ending you have what? Pul innama ana basharun mithlukum yuha ilayya. Innama ilahukum ilahu wahid. Say, ana, I, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ana basharun mithlukum. I'm a man just like you. But the difference is yuha ilayya. But revelation has come to me. I'm similar to you. Revelation has come to me, which has made all the difference. Over there is, Say, Allah is the one who takes and adopts no son. Over here, it ends with, say, I'm a man just like you. And then, in the beginning of Sutul Kahf, also it says, it criticizes Christ Christianity. Let me just show you here very quickly. Uh, Allah number four to Allah will warn those people who say Allah has adopted a son. So this issue, okay? 
and then to the Kahf, uh, sorry, so the uh, Maryam. ends with the same issue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to uh, excuse people who say Allah has taken for himself it is not uh, that you call upon uh, Allah that Allah has a son Okay, so all three surahs talking about Allah having a son. What? How does this relate to anything? Because Sutul Kahf, it's connected to Sutul Kahf, and the Jal will claim to be the Messiah. And the Messiah, according to Christianity, is the son of God. Okay, and so Allah is saying in Sutul Kahf, which is the surah of the Jal, I will not take a son, and no one should say I am the son of God, which is what, what the Messiah will claim. Okay, so these three surahs, they're talking about Allah is not going to take a son. And these three surahs, they talk about miracles. The greatest miracle, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, in Surah Al-Maryam. Then the miracle of all the non-prophets mentioned one after the other. Okay, And then before that, the Surah Al-Isra, the miracle, the greatest miracle given to any prophet, a spiritual, you can say, miracle. And that was the Miraj, Isra and Miraj of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? Now, the other relationship is what? Now let me show you this. This surah ends with, because there are two quls, Sutul Isra ends with two quls, qul and then qul. And Sutul Kahf ends with qul and then qul. So you'll see this. The second last verse, Sutul 110, makes one very important point, which is connected between the three surahs also. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ, قُلْ أُدُوا اللَّهَ أَوْ إِذُوا الرَّحْمَانِ Call upon Allah or call upon Rahman. أَيَّمَا تَدْعُوهُ أَيَّمَا تَدْعُوهُ فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى Which of the names you choose to call Allah by, His is the most beautiful names. وَلَا تَجْحَرْ بِصَلَاتِكَ and don't be out loud in your dua to Allah. Salat here doesn't mean your normal prayers. Okay, because those are defined by the prophets. Salat in its literal meaning means dua. Also in the hadith literature, if you find the word salat, uh, many times it means dua. It doesn't mean uh, it doesn't mean prayers as we do the standing or and sujood with out loud or silent. Okay. Don't make your prayer too loud and don't be, make it too silent. And then Allah is going to give you the opposite example in a second. Meaning when you're making a formal prayer, then in your formal prayer, make it so you can hear yourself. Okay. But follow the course between the two. This is one meaning of the verse. But the point is, the second qul, the first qul of Sutul Isra is for dua. Okay. And the second qul of Surah Al-Kahf is about, over there it says Allah has all the most beautiful names, whichever names, okay? Over here, qul law kana al-bahru midada li kalimati rabbi. The kalimas of Allah, the praises of Allah, the words of Allah, the Quran, the tasbihat, the names of Allah, all these things are so many, right? Look, if the uh, if all the oceans became the kalimas of Allah, the praises of Allah, all the attributes of Allah, all the names of Allah, all the words of Allah, all the tasbihat of Allah, right? Then you know all those oceans will finish and the and the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not finish. You have the similar situation both in terms of dua. Let me share with you what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about uh, dua in the very beginning. Okay. إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ يَعْنِي زَكَرِيَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ إِذْ نَادَاهُ رَبُّهُ نِدَاءً خَفِيَةً And remember when 
uh, when Zakariya alayhi salatu wasalam, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nida'an khafiya, a silent uh, dua, okay, a dua in himself, okay. Now, over here, I want to share with you, before I talk about, I, I had a lot of subjects I wanted to talk about today, but I'm just going to limit it to uh, one aspect, um, which is I want to uh, show you. Um, okay, yeah, let me just do that. Okay, I'll come back to that, inshallah. So now I wanted to share with you. So it's very clear that this portion of history, meaning the times of the Jad, are pointing to the fact that there should be a lot of emphasis on uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use non-prophets for miraculous things. And this is why... For example, you have some of the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ that say in the end times, a mu'min will not wake up except he will see true dreams. So this is the beginning of that, you can say, seeing uh, miraculous things happening. And then you also have, for example, the hadith that's very famous, that when the Muslims will be fighting against uh, Banu Israel or those that claim to be part of Bani Israel, that you know the rocks will talk and the plants will talk and Sometimes we give different types of explanations to that, like, you know, there must be some sort of IDs that they will be carrying. Uh, so anyway, uh, the point being that why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us in this place that uh, Allah is putting our gaze or our emphasis on the, on the idea that uh, non-prophets can do uh, miracles because uh, we live in times uh, where we've stopped believing in miracles and we've stopped believing that there are people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use to do his miraculous things and this is something that affects our spirituality okay and this is something that uh, affects our connection with the angels and with the spiritual world even before the these times of fitan, okay, even before this, like I'm saying, even if you go back uh, maybe to the time of even 60, 70, 80 years ago, it was very common for scholars of Islam to discuss the miracles of people of their time and the miracles of the people before. And many, many books on the miracles of not the prophets, but miracles and the karamat of those and over here, I want to mention there are two types of miracles. And most of you know some of this. One is the miracle of a prophet, which is called Mu'ajza. But Mu'ajza is also of, uh, you can say, a miracle of a prophet is also of two types. One is a miracle, the prophet is going, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he hits a place where there was no well, he hits a place, a water comes out. It's a miracle. The other is, I'm a prophet of Allah. You have to believe in me. Okay, if you're a prophet of Allah, what's your proof? Okay, here's the proof. I'm a prophet of Allah. Here's my miracle. I've done something supernatural by the will of Allah who created this natural universe. I've done something supernatural. I broke the laws of nature. Okay, so Musa alayhi when he comes with a miracle, like the staff or the bayda where he shows his hand. This is a claim. I am the prophet of Allah. And believe me, here's the proof. Or when a prophet says, look at the mountain and a camel comes out, you have to obey me. I'm the prophet of Allah. Okay. So this is one, this is called Mu'adza. The Mu'adza of the prophet sallallahu is the Quran. Okay. So the proof, I'm a prophet. The proof, this is here. Okay. The other is, you're going and then something happens. You did something or something happens. Something uh, miraculous happens. You're going and you have a fish and the fish becomes alive and goes into the sea. Oh, that's kind of miraculous, right? 
well, you didn't, you didn't make any claim based upon it that you're a prophet or you're this or you're that. No, it's just something that happened, something miraculous that happened. This type of miracle is called karama. Okay, it's the karam of Allah. It's the graciousness of Allah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a miracle. Allah allowed you to see a miracle. Allah allowed you to see something supernatural. And to some degree, we all as mu'mineen should expect miracles in our life as kiramas. Not mu'za because we're not making claims of being a prophet because that's only for the prophets. But the Prophet وسلم, if you add up his miracles in his lifetime, I'm not going to talk about this subject right now, but I'm just mentioning that if you add up the miracles in the time of the Prophet وسلم, you know, around 2000, Imam Nathamiya says, other people have written other books, Qadi Iyad also, I think in his book, Ashifa, he also mentions uh, more than a thousand, but at least one in every three days, the Prophet was showing a miracle of some sort, not Mu'za, but kirama, something special happening, right? The prophet giving someone a bone of milk, and then he drinks it to the full and gives it to 60 other people, and they're all full. So the prophet was showing all the time that he's a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the prophet was given the greatest miracles, and in meaning the greatest number of miracles, in those greatest number of miracles, the greatest miracle was Isra wa Miraj. That miracle is more for us which I'm not going to talk about today because that miracle proves to us he's really the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than it was a trial for the people before. But it is a proof for us today. But I'm not, uh, that's not the subject I want to talk about. Uh, I think I have a video on uh, Isra wal Miraj and its miraculous aspect that you can uh, maybe appreciate even today. You can appreciate today more than before. Okay. Um, Uh, okay, uh, yes, sure, show me, bismillah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam. Looking very fresh today, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, one of the miracles in Surah Maryam that I found, uh, if you wanted to, to maybe show on the screen, is uh, Surah Maryam verse 19. Um, yeah. The angel said to Maryam alayhi salam, Right, uh, uh, the, an angel said to Maryam alayhi salam, an angel is something that is outside of the contemporary world, that he is, that I am only a messenger, messenger of your Lord to give you the gift of a pure son. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's probably, then that's Jibreel alayhi salam. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so now if you go to verse 91, right, you flip the 19 to 91, what is it saying? It's saying the totally opposite. By the thing. way, this this is Brother Imran from the uh, End Games production. <laughs> end game, End Game eschatology. Oh, End Game eschatology. Sorry, yeah. maybe it's so Yeah. So here it's saying that the the earth is about to split and the mountains are about to crumble because they attributed a sun to the Most Merciful. So it's a totally opposite. One is an angel saying it. And the other is like the heavens, something that is in the contemporary world is about to fall because of this massive uh, claim that they are saying. Okay, mashallah. So, uh, yes, mashallah. I see what you're saying. Okay, thank you. So this, this has something to do with the number 19. It's not a complete project yet, but... Uh, this is just something just on the subject of beautifying the Quran for what it is. Okay, great. Thank you. Jazakumullah khairan. So I was saying that even 50, 60 years ago, it was very common for people to sit down and read books about the, the kiramat of the people that were pious. Okay and to believe in it, and to see it, and to experience it. And it was common for households, like religious households, like let's say, uh, that, let's say, you know, that uh, they would expect miracles to happen. Someone in our family, like someone in our family has to be a hafiz. 
Same way someone in our family, maybe Allah will give them a miracle. Or so, and it was very common to read books of the pious predecessors, the people before us and their miracles. And one of my advices to all of you is that we need to revive this because the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, has seen more miracles than any other Ummah before. Okay, just for example, you know, uh, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, when he was being beaten, okay, uh, for his stance on the Quran is the eternal word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when this issue was raised and he was being beaten and uh, his clothes, you know, he had the, the, the izar, usually the, uh, the cloth around you, like we do in Umrah, for example, right? When he was being beaten, uh, many people saw that the izar was coming off and coming off and then something happened and held the izar of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal from coming off. This was a miracle that people saw. And like this, we have forgotten the miracles of our great ones, okay? That, uh, that, that have been done in the lifetime of different uh, uh, scholars, awliya Allah, the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to revive this. Uh, yes, so this is what I was thinking um, you know, right now I just finished translating uh, Naim bin Hamad's Kitab al Fitan, as some of you know. So that's, you know, I'm still going through that. It might be a process of a few months still. Uh, Naim bin Hamad's book to complete might take me another three months. But one of the projects that I'll have in mind is collecting authentic, uh, you can say, uh, because the, the rule in history is this is that the more miraculous something is, the more strange something is, the more proof you need that it happened. Meaning, if someone said that scholar X had this miracle, then, and this is the, the, the you know, uh, the Mulla Shibli Nomani Rahmatullah who wrote the Sira book, very fam you guys will not be familiar with this, but uh, those people of my uh, generation and the older generation, they know this particular book, uh, Noman Shibli's uh, book on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a historian and then his student, Mona Suleiman, and then his student and his brother actually, uh, who is maybe well, more well known, uh, Abu Hassan Nadwi Rahmatullah Alayhi. So these were historians, Muslim historians. And in fact, uh, the Saviors of the Islamic Spirit, the seven volumes is written by Abu Hassan Nadwi Rahmatullah And so they have a criteria, they have a criteria which is basically the more strange an event than the more evidence you need. And it can, just can't be in one book. You need uh, more than one contemporary person talking about that event. So it's it, it would be an exhaustive uh, thing. There are other books written by other scholars that I might recommend. Maybe the books of Imam Shawli al Mahadas Denvi on this subject. Um, well, I'll see inshallah, but I'll, I'll do something about that. But definitely it was a common thing. Miracles happen all the time. It's just that we don't notice it, but if we become cognizant of it, we'll notice it, right? And so if you notice uh, in Sultan Kahf when the fish goes into the water, right? It wasn't something like, it wasn't like, oh my God, you know, the fish became alive and oh my God, like uh, that's a miracle. No. This is something adi, and it was just something like normal, right? It was just something that was just happened. And it wasn't the first time, it wasn't the last time. And this is how our lives have to be. You don't have to be a perfect mu'min to see th these things are not based upon how you can have a great person who's very close to Allah, super close to Allah, and he may not have miracles. But Imam uh, Ibn Hajar, rahmatullahi the great muhaddis, uh, you know, he says miracles are like walking in the desert and when sand comes up, it just happens, right? So you're walking in the desert. Sometimes you walk, no sand comes up. Other times you kick the, uh, the ground and the sand will rise up. And so this is the same with uh, miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the great miracles we can even still see today uh, is, is the effect of the, the Quran on the shayateen that when you do the ruqya and the, uh, the shaitan is affected, there's something we can all see. But we have become less, you can say, you know, we have the ayat of Allah in the heavens, 
right? The stars and the moon and the sun and everything Allah created in the heavens and the earth, that's there too. But in addition to that, there's also the miracle of our human experience. And each one of us, if we go back, each one of us, you'll notice that something at some level miraculous happened to each one of us. And we need to be open to those experiences and to acknowledge those experiences as miracles as, as in our lives in order to progress spiritually, you see. Because uh, to accept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, did something miraculous for you or with you or through you, whatever it may be, to accept that is to accept a certain type of relationship, okay? It, you, many of you may have had true dreams. So none of us, uh, or rather all of us, uh, is in a position to have miracles from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the other thing I wanted to talk about, but I'm running out of time, is the relationship between fitans, fitans, difficulties, and miraculousness. Okay, the more the fitan, the more the difficulty, the more the miracles. And so one of the things that you'll find in Sutul Kahf is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving miracles even to the non-prophets. And one of the reasons, like the Ashab al Kahf, for example, or the uh, the man that was being mocked at, right? That's a type of difficulty. Uh, or the even uh, if you look at Musa and Khidr, his relationship from uh, one of these, this perspective of miraculous, when the boat was broken, the people didn't realize that that's actually a miracle taking place, right? Something bad happened and who, who knows what they thought, but it was uh, actually something good happening to them, something miraculous happening to them. Uh, so anyway, my point is the more the fitans are, the more the difficulties are, then either at that time you see the miracles, if there's a lot of fitans, what is the example of that? Two examples I'll give you. The Prophet ﷺ had his Isra wal Miraj win when he was in the lowest ebb of his difficulties in his seerah of his life. Khatija had passed away. Abu Talib had passed away. He had decided, okay, let me, I've been doing that one now, you know, for eight some years in Mecca, and the response has been very poor. Now let me go to the next big city, Ta'if. Let me try over there. So the Prophet went there, and they did worse to him than what was already happening in, in Mecca. And now the Prophet had to come back, you see, under the protection of a non-Muslim. As a Hanif, he had to come back. So when he's now there, he's not even a free man. And in that situation, the Prophet is given two miraculous things. One is the meeting of the jinns at that time. And the second is Srawal al Miraj. So my point being is that when difficulties come, the miracles can be expected. Then in terms of Bani Israel, Bani Israel was, you know, in a great fitna. They had the Roman Empire over them. Then they had hardly any money. They were going through a famine at that time of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. They had no resources. They were being used as slaves by the Roman Empire to build, you know, buildings and so on and so forth. And their own ulama, their Pharisees, the people in charge who were in cahoots with the Roman Empire were oppressing the believers. The believers, as you know, were being oppressed. Zakaria was killed. Yahya was killed. So the believers were being oppressed. And in this time of oppression, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his greatest miracle, Isa Okay. The other time where miracles happen is Zulqarnain, when you establish justice. Okay. When you establish justice, okay, then what will happen? Then the miracles of Allah will come. Then the Nile will listen to the command of Umar bin Khattab, as you many of you may know the story of when Umar wrote the letter to the Nile. Okay. So or when Umar radiallahu anh, was giving the khutbah and he saw the army in Iraq being attacked from the other side, he mentioned in his khutbah and they heard his voice, you know. So the point being that uh, mir miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala either happen when you establish justice or when the fitnas come. As the fitnas come, expect and be open to the idea that Allah may show me a miracle to hold me strong 
and hold me in difficult times, okay? And uh, just another example of that, just for the purpose of saying this, is also when Yusuf والسلام, was with, right in that situation, you know, biha, he had almost emotionally inclined to uh, Yusuf والسلام, he had emotionally inclined towards the lady. Okay. Had he not seen the burhan, the proof, or you could say the miracle from his Rabb, which is that uh, some of the narrations they say uh, that Yusuf والسلام, at that point he saw the face of his father going like, don't do that. So this is one explanation of that verse. Either way, the point being, the main point is that the more the fitnas, then the more you can expect uh, to be given uh, the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be held fast in your iman. And and this is something you should, if you want, you can pray for. Allah, show me a miracle. There's nothing wrong with that. And many people did. Many great, great scholars of the past did, you know. And, uh, uh, you know, so anyway, I will end here. Maybe next time I'll talk about a list of, pro of uh, scholars of Islam uh, uh, who have seen these miracles happen in their lifetime, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. All right, bismillah walhamdulillah. Today I want to talk about something very, very important. It's so important that even many of the very learned people, they haven't, uh, they haven't put their full grasp on this uh, issue. And I want to talk about it. And then, inshallah, we can make it a little bit interactive. And, uh, and then, uh, I hope, inshallah, it will be a benefit for all of you to be able to understand uh, this tasawwur uh, al-jami' this comprehensive view of the deen. Uh, and you all know, and you can all answer, you know, I want to make this a little bit interactive. You all know the hadith of Jibra'il, right? You all know the hadith of Jibreel where Jibreel came and he asked the questions of what is Islam, what is Iman, what is Ihsan, and then they talked about the signs of the Day of Judgment, right? You all know this, right? Okay, now, my question to you all, and any one of you can answer, inshallah, because we'll make this... Uh, we will make this an interactive session of learning between me and you. Um, my question to you is, is what is the difference? Uh, is there a difference? Let's say I give you, uh, let's say I give you, uh, let's say I give you a, a pen or I give you this, okay? So I give you this, I say, buy it for me for $5. Now let's say you pay me $5 and you buy this. Now this is yours, right? This is yours based upon which of the four categories? This is yours. Which of the four categories? According to Islam, this would be your property, right? According to Islam, this would be your property. Why? Because you bought it for me. But based upon not Islam, but Iman, it would be what? Everything belongs to who? Everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what I'm trying to show you is the rules that underline these four categories. The rules of Islam are different. The rules of Iman and the foundations of Iman are different. The rules of Ihsan are different. The rules of understanding Ayyamullah, the days of Allah or Taghayyurat and the changing in the days or changing changes as they come in history those rules are different, okay? What does Islam look at? What does Iman look at on its foundational level? What does Ihsan look at on its foundational level? What is the of the of the changing of the days of Allah as they happen, as time changes? What does that look at? Uh, what are the foundations of that, okay? So 
Let me give you an example, and then I will ask uh, you a question, maybe based upon that, we'll see. If someone says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Based upon this statement, he has become Muslim based upon which of the four categories? Hmm? Based, if someone says Islam, right? Does this mean that he has Iman? If he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, if he says this, does this mean he has Iman? No. It doesn't mean that. Let me share with you one part of the Quran which you will find very interesting that uh, touches on part of this subject. Let me share with you. And so what I want to share with you is some of the basic foundational differences uh, between these four categories. And sometimes when we're chatting or when we're talking, we're not clear about some of these issues. So today I want to make some of these issues a little bit more clear. Uh, okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah. Uh, where did you go? There you go. Okay. Let me show you this very interesting verse. Okay. This is the verse. And what is it? You don't see class. Hold on one second. Uh, hold on one second. Okay. Bismillah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. The desert Bedouins, they say to the Prophet Amanna, we have believed. What does Allah say to them? Because this is at the end, you know, when Islam had become successful and Muhammad had become the, uh, you can say, the crownless king of Arabia. So at that time, the Bedouins, they were coming in crowds after crowds and accepting Islam because Islam is now the new big thing. And so they were accepting Islam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about their saying that we have believed. So they, some of them said, we believe now. But Allah said in response, The desert Bedouins, they say, we have Iman. Qul, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let them know. Lam tu'minu. No, you don't believe yet. Walakin qulu aslamna. But instead, you should say what? You should say, Aslamna, we have surrendered to Islam. Then what does Allah say? Walamma yadkhulul iman, imanu fi qulubikum. And is iman, true iman, true faith, true burning iman has not yet entered your hearts. Okay. So you also have the scenario of what? You also have the scenario of when uh, I think it was uh, Zayd bin Harith, radiyallahu anh, when he killed someone, or he was fighting someone and he killed him, but before he killed him, he took the shahad. And the Prophet said, did you open his heart and see? The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did you open his heart and see if he had, if he, what will you do with his, uh, his shahad on the day of judgment, O oh, Zayd? And the Prophet was very angry. The point being that the rules of Islam are different. The rules of Iman are different. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Think about this very, very carefully. Does Iman increase or decrease? Or does Iman, or if there is, or does Iman not increase and decrease? Which one is it? Which one do you think it is? Both. Very good. How? Why is it both? Does Iman increase or decrease? Or Iman doesn't increase and decrease? Depends upon faith? No. 
depends upon which cat of the four categories you're looking at. Are you looking at it from an Islamic perspective? Are you looking at it from the Imaniyat perspective? Are you looking at it from the perspective of Ihsan? Or are you looking at it from the perspective of the changing of the days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If you are saying in the courts of Islam, according to the Islam, anytime anyone says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah has become Muslim. There's no such thing as a higher Muslim and a lower Muslim. You're all Muslim. You can't say, I'm going to go to the court, the Islamic Sharia court, and say, I have more iman, so I should have more money. I have more iman, so my inheritance should be more. No. At the level of Islam, iman more increases and decreases. All Muslims are the same. The muttaqi, he has to give zakat and pray five times a day. The one who is a fajr, disobedient to Allah and is a Muslim, he has to also give zakat and pray five times a day. If, um, if, if, if somebody becomes Muslim by saying La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and he has the intent to become Muslim and hurt Islam, he's still Muslim because we see only what? We see, we see the external. So Islam deals with the external. Okay. Someone says La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and even if he's, uh, uh, you know, some a person with some agenda, he can marry my sister, he can have the inheritance of a Muslim and so on and so forth, all of that will be there. Even though he entered Islam and many people in Medina, many of the, the, the Jews that were in Medina entered Islam for the very reason of hurting Islam. And they were the munafiqeen. The true munafiq is the one who claims to be a Muslim on the outside, but has absolutely no iman in the inside. That's a munafiq. So the rules of Islam are different the rules of Iman are different. So now at the level of Iman, does Iman increase and decrease? What do you think? Does Iman increase and decrease at the level of Iman? What do you think? So, yes. So there's one person, he's saying, no, Iman doesn't increase and decrease. All Muslims are the same. Another person is saying, no, Iman increases and decreases. So he's talking from a different category. He's talking from a different perspective. <coughs> right? So these two things, especially the difference between Islam and Iman, you have to know when you're talking about issues. Okay. Am I talking about this from an Islamic perspective? Or am I talking about this from the perspective of Imaniyat? One very big mistake people make is the misuse of the word haram. Any sin becomes haram. Oh, you lied, it's haram. Oh, you did this, it's haram. Every sin is not haram. Haram is a word that falls in the category of Islam. Okay? And haram is only used, that Allah has made something haram, this is a very big high level of category. You killed someone, you did magic, you did shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you were extremely disrespectful to your parents. Haram, the word haram is used for big sins. I want you to be very careful about how we Muslims use the word haram, because we use it to uh, loosely and haram is a very important word in the Quran and it should be used properly it's only for the big sin so not everything uh, uh, anyone does becomes haram some things are debatable right uh, for example some things can have the ijtihadi issues it's haram that uh, somebody could say it's haram that you're listening to music for example or it's haram that you're you don't have a beer no, the, the beard is wajib and it is sunnah of the Prophet There is a sin for it, but it's not haram. It's not like murder. It's not like doing magic. It's not like, you know, uh, doing some of the, making partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not every sin becomes haram. 
So, and in fact, uh, yeah, so munafiq, a true munafiq is the one who presents himself as a Muslim, but internally is conspiring with the opposite side. Okay, so for example, Quran says, وَإِذَا, وَإِذَا آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا. When they meet the believers, they say, We have Iman. They tell us, Oh, I believe, I believe. وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ And when they're left alone with their shayateen, maybe the ins, the human beings, or the jinn, whoever they're left alone with, قَالُوا إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ No, we're actually with you. نَحْنُ الْمُسْتَحْزِئُونَ We're just mocking them. So they say, we have iman to you. These politicians, when they talk about Islam, they're just mocking you. Only to go back to their big ones, their leaders. One of the meaning of shayateen in this ayah means their leaders. Okay? So, وَإِذَا لَكُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ قَالُوا إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ إِنَّا مَنَحْنُ مُسْتَحْدِيُونَ We're only mocking them. Then, you know, there are different levels. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the munafiq, the alamatul, the sign of a munafiq, because we can never know who's truly munafiq internally. Okay? Either the Prophet knew that, or the companions were told by the Prophet, then they would know that. But other than that, we have only signs of Somebody who's a munafiq. Okay. So there are different categories of that, but I'm not going to go into the details of that. I wouldn't go that far because most of it's being done in ignorance. But anyway, but what I was trying to say is that there is Islam. Okay. So does Iman depend upon A'mal? There's only one, or there's a few a'mal that have to do with iman, and majority of the a'mal, they have to do with Islam. Like, bunya islam wa'ala khamsin, Islam is built upon over five things, right? So the foundations of Islam are built on what? The shahada, the salah, the zakat, and these are the foundations on which the building of Islam, the ummah, is built, okay? Even though that building has now been broken because we don't have, for example, the Amir of Jihad taking us to, uh, or the Amir of Hajj taking us to Hajj. We don't have the Khalifa giving us a khutbah. So that whole system has been broken because in the olden days, the khutbah would be given by the Khalifa. The big khutbah would be given by the Khalifa in Mecca. So what should be happening is the Muslim leaders should be sitting in Mecca and Medina and talking to the Muslim world and telling us actually what's going on in the world and the lectures that Sheikh Imran Hussein, for example, gives, uh, they should be actually be given from Makkah and Medina. And then the whole Muslim world should be listening to those, you see. But uh, they have their prayers and their du'as, and they have, you know, they hide the, they have give them the written khutbah, and so then the Muslim world is not really well connected. Anyway, that's a separate issue. The issue I want to talk about here is something very important. The difference between Islam and Iman, first of all, okay? Islam is based upon a different set of rules. Iman is based upon a different set of rules. Okay. Iman is how much you have tasdeeq, you have confirmation in your heart that what are the six imaniyat? Belief in Allah, right? Belief in the akhirah, belief in the books of Allah, belief in the prophets of Allah, belief in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and belief in the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the six. Okay, the more you have proof that this is reality, Iman has to do with reality, and Islam has to do with the external. Okay, in a sense, Iman has to do with how much you believe in these six things. Okay, Allah, His messengers, the Malaika, the Day of Judgment, books of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the, the Qadr of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the destiny Allah has written for. Uh, ourselves and all of mankind and all of the universe okay so islam is something separate it has different rules okay the way you will understand something in islam for example in islam islam tells us to pray right salat bunya islam wa ala khamsin islam is built upon five things so one of them is prayers how do we know we have to pray oh allah says aqimus salat allah gives us a command pray and then Allah gives us a command of certain aspects of prayer. What if Ka'u was to do, right? Um, right? So Allah says, stand up in prayers. Um, in Layla illa qalila. 
Allah says do ruku, Allah says do sujood. So these are parts of Islam. And how do you determine those? You determine those by the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah gives you a command to do something, He gives you a command not to do something, this is part of Islam. When He gives you a certain encouragement, it may not be a command. For example, the Prophet said, Iqbaluha, let your beard grow. It's a command from the Prophet. But is the command of the Prophet equal to the command of Allah when Allah said, Aqimu Salah, establish the prayers? Or is there a difference? This subject for scholars is a subject of Islam. They're studying Islam. They're looking at things within Islam. Okay. And so if the Prophet gave a command, is that the same as, is the hukum of that the same as when Allah gave a command? So like, for example, in the case of Ya'faluha, for example, or the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, that uh, if it was not difficult to find my ummah, you know, I would have my ummah doing miswak for every prayers and other narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for example, for doing miswak, does miswak become fard by the Prophet saying that? Uh, does uh, the beard become part by the Prophet saying, let the beard grow? And he gives the Prophet gives a command for the beard to grow. Does it become part for that? No, because the Islam is a special subject with its own rules that understands, okay, this is what is absolutely commanded. This is what is encouraged. This is what is sunnah. This is what sunnah muakkada is. This is what is makruh, disliked. This is what is completely haram. How do we know it's completely haram? What are the rules of something that is completely haram? Right? So this is Islam. What is Iman interested in? Iman is interested in how much you believe and agree and have conviction in your heart. So for example, there can be somebody who externally is not doing anything of Islam. He is externally, let's say he doesn't pray, he doesn't do zakat, he doesn't do so he doesn't uh, fast, he doesn't do any of the externals. But internally he has Iman. Internally he believes in Allah. And his faith, you know, I've seen people like this. They don't do anything externally. But when you talk to them, their Iman is like so strong. Their reliance on Allah and their belief in Allah and their belief in the Akhirah and the belief that they're accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so strong that it's almost amazing. Imagine how much more they would be if they were doing, actually acting on the Islamic aspect of it, the foundation, right? So, Iman is that how much tasdikum bil qalb? At tasdikum bima ja'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is one of the definitions of Iman. Iman is the confirmation in your heart that you confirm that whatever Prophet Muhammad brought is true. Okay? And so, Iman is an internal thing and it has its own rules right and islam is an external thing and it has its own rules what is fart what is sunnah when is something commanded how do you know it's commanded how do you know it's just encouraged like when the prophet gave the command and i'm repeating this one because so i can stay with one example and explain it so when the prophet gave the example grow the beard right so that command was it as a command or was that as, an, as a strong encouragement that this is my sunnah do this, right? So obviously the command of the Prophet was not as the same as the command of Aqim salah right? The beard is not the same as establishing the prayers, but is it highly, highly, highly encouraged? Yes, is there a sin, not haram, is sin, which is dham, or is it khata, or is it dham, or is it as an ism? It's a sin. To disobey the Prophet, yes. But it's not haram. Meaning the act itself is not haram. It's not like murdering someone. Then Iman, let's come at the level of Iman. Iman is how much you really believe something is true. And you, and then if you really have Iman, then what will happen? Then it will automatically manifest itself externally in some shape or form. Okay, Generally, that's speaking. I gave the exception of that I've met people that have very strong iman, but they don't do external acts, right? But these are two different components and we should not forget this. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about before I go further on Ihsan and then the tagayrat of the ayyam is that, now I'm talking about fundamental things Muslims should know about their deen, okay? What is it that the deen wants from us? And I'm gonna explain this to you. 
to you in a second, inshallah. But right now, at the level of Islam, I want it to be very, very clear. There are things that are qat'i, that are absolute. La ilaha illallah is absolute. Right? And then there are things that are not absolute. They're very likely, very, very likely, there's a very strong argument for it, a very logical argument. It is very likely, but you still can't say it's qat'i. You can't say it's absolute. You have to be very clear about the things you consider absolute and the things that you are not absolute, no matter how strongly you feel about it. So for example, I'll give you an example. I feel, based upon my research and my understanding, and now I'm almost 50 years old, so more than 30 years of learning and thinking, I feel Yajuj and Majuj are out. Hardly anyone can ever convince me of not thinking that. I'm 100% convinced Yajuj and Majuj are out. I'm 100% convinced we're living in the last days. 100%. But it will still not necessarily fall into the category of qatari, absolute. Until you have a text in the Quran that says, you are now living in the last days. It will always be a product of the human mind. It will always be a product of the human mind. It is my application of my mind. Like Sheikh Imran Hussain says, we need people to think. The absolute things are the things the Quran says clearly. That those things the Quran itself calls muhkamat, absolutely clear. Those are absolutely qat'i, they're uncompromisable. Muhammad Rasulullah, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, etc., etc. Right? Those are the things that are absolutely. Because why is this important? It's important that when we're talking to each other, we don't forget that when we're talking about, and I'm going to talk about the rules of the end times, okay, in a little bit, that when we're talking about the end times, a lot of the category that falls, because all these four, right, Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and Tughayrat of Ayyam, you can, they all have things that are absolute, and they all have things that are not absolute. For example, um, uh, let's say um, reading uh, just there, I'll just give one example. I don't want to give a bad example, but let's say something that has a difference of opinion reading, uh, let's say with a prayer. Okay. The Hanafi say it's wajib. The Shafi say it's sunnah. Okay. So it's not qat'i. It's not absolute. You, even if you feel very strongly about something, it's not absolute. It's not like la ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah, where it is in the Quran, it's in the nas of Quran, it's in the wordings of Quran, and the wordings of Quran are telling you something. Versus your the wordings are not there, but you are interpreting the word to say something. These are two very different things. So when we're looking at the Quran, and I'm saying, look at this verse, and look at this history, and look at this article and I'm putting things together, then most likely it's not the text that's speaking to you, it's the brain being applied to the text that's speaking to you. And so therefore it does not fall in the category of qat'i absolute. It falls in the category of lanni, even though it may be true. Majority of the things that are true are in the category of lanni itself, but they're not qat'i, they're not absolute. They may be very close to absolute in their evidence, but they're not absolute. Majority of the thing, is it very, is it possible that everything I'm teaching about Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the Day of Judgment and about that we're close to the end of the times, is there any chance that I could be wrong? Yes, there's a chance. I may not, I could be wrong as a whole. I could be wrong in some particulars. I could be wrong because I'm applying my mind to the Quran and letting the Quran speak to me in that way. But it's not qata. It's not like la ilaha wa Muhammad Rasulullah. So at the level of Islam, at the level of Iman, same thing. The things that are absolute within Imaniyat, Yeah, so I didn't want to go into that. But I will say that I don't generally like the word aqidah. This word aqidah throws us off. Aqidah is a subject of theology. 
and different people define aqidah in different ways. Some people define aqidah to only mean the things you believe in, for example. And some people define iman or aqidah uh, as uh, certain actions with the faith. So this is our aqidah, this is what we believe in. The Quranic term is iman. So I'd like to stick to the, uh, the hadith of Jibreel in that sense, that I don't like the word aqidah. Yes, I could, even though I 100% believe, I 100%, 1000% believe that Dhul Qarnayn is Cyrus the Great. I believe that. Believe not in the sense of my Imaniya. And this is what I'm trying to say. That in terms of my knowledge and intellect, see, let me go back a little bit. I'm going to share with you something important. There is something called epistemology. Epistemology is the subject of knowing what is knowledge. What do, how do I know what I know is really what is true? Okay, so how do we know something is true? So you can divide this into two big categories. There are other categories too, but two big ones. You either know something is true by revelation, wahi, because Allah said so, it must be true, or by the acquired human knowledge over time. I learned how to build the fire, then I built the wheel, then I built, you know, different things, and now I can build a computer, and then so on and so forth. So this is how I know. I either know by revelation, yes, Mahdi could be. Uh, somebody said they can't hear me. Do other people have the same problem? I think you need to click on the mute button and fix it from there. Okay, anyway, so I was saying that if I say my research tells me Cyrus the Great is Yadjud and Majuj, but Quran doesn't say Cyrus the Great is Yadjud and Majuj. I say, look, the word Zulqarnain was asked by the Jews to the Prophet, meaning they asked him about Zulqarnain. And the Bible uses the word Zulqarnain in the chapter of Daniel many times referring to Cyrus the Great. Okay. Um, so if somebody can help out that brother in the chat, that would be fine. But I was saying, if I very strongly believe and I have the evidence, I can say, look, the Bible says Zulqarnain and it's referring to Cyrus the Great and their source of knowledge was the Bible. That's how they ask the questions. They ask based upon these scriptures. And... Uh, then what? Then uh, then this is why I believe Cyrus the Great. You know, my evidence, right? I have 100 evidences to say Cyrus the Great is Zulqarnain, but the Quran doesn't say it, period. You have to be able to divide what is absolute and what is not absolute. What is your feeling of what is true and what is the Quran saying is absolutely true? Okay? So all those, for me, when something comes in Quran, all of its dimensions are true. Whether it is the person Cyrus the Great, whether it is that Zulqarnain will be coming in two different epochs, you can say, or we're living in a time where we have to bring two different, uh, you can say, knowledges together, or whether it is from the perspective that we have to hold on to the Sunnah of the Prophet or that knowledge of the past with the knowledge of where it's going in the future and bringing them together, whether you take it that way, in all of its different shapes and forms, Zulqarnain will hold true as long as it's true to the word. But again, you have to make a distinction. Whatever I say of the word Zulqarnain, whether it is Cyrus the Great, whether it is two different uh, points in history or two forms of knowledge, so on and so forth, whatever I will say, that is not Qat'i. It is not definite. It can be close to definite. The more it is closer to the language of Quran, like for example, if we take Zulqarnain, and I say Zulqarnain is Cyrus the Great. Now I'm going to ask you guys this question. If I say 100% Zulqarnain is Cyrus the Great, and another person says 100% Zulqarnain means two different epochs, okay, two different Qarans, who is closer to the Quran in terms of interpretation? 
not who's more right, but in terms of as interpretation, who's more closer to the Quran. The two ages, because that is the Quran itself speaking. Right? So even though you all know that I believe 100%, and when I say believe, I want to make a distinction between imaniyat, which I was talking to, and I believe in terms of I trust my brain enough to understand who is Dulqarnain, which is Cyrus the Great. But could I be wrong? Could I be wrong? Yes, I can be wrong. The person who says two apochs uh, is probably closer to the Quran in a sentence, the exact wordings of is hanging on to the Arabic words of the Quran. Okay. So uh, Well, this is a longer question. In my opinion, I don't know if the Mahdi is born or not, but he's not coming anytime soon. Okay, this is my feeling. Again, if I feel the Mahdi is not coming anytime soon, is that a Qat'i knowledge or is that Vanni knowledge? Tell me. Right, in Vanni, it's not absolute. It's not like La ilaha illallah. It's not like a verse in the Quran says, that the Mahdi will come in such and such age at such and such time. I can give you my dalil. I can say, you know, we still need the greater Israel to be established. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first nations to the first nation to be destroyed will be the Persian and then the Arabs. Okay, so the war with Iran will happen first. This is all interpretation. And then the war with the Arabs will happen. That's interpretation. That's not qatri. That's my taking a saying of the Prophet and giving it interpretation. Okay, giving it interpretation means it's not absolute. If the words are speaking to you themselves, then that's absolute. Okay, but if you have to apply your mind to it, so we're living in the end times. We're living in the end times because we have tall buildings. Let's say we have the Arabs who built the tall buildings. Pretty close, right? Pretty close, we know the Arabs and we know they're tall buildings, pretty close. But is it Qat'i? Is it Qat'i? The Arabs and building tall buildings, what do you think? Okay, but stick with what I'm talking about. The Prophet said the sign of, one of the signs of the Day of Judgment is tall Arabs building tall buildings and competing in tall buildings. Is now will you say, can you say based upon what we see today that that's pretty close to that hadith? What do you think? I think so too. It's pretty close to Qat'i even though it's still Vanni because it's still interpretation. But it's closer to Qat'i because it's right there before us. We're all witnessing this statement of the Prophet that the Prophet said the Arabs will compete in making tall buildings, right? And, you know, those people that were Bedouins, they'll be, I mean, who would ever thought Bedouins will compete in making tall buildings like we see now? It's pretty close to being Qat'i, meaning it's, it's pretty close to being Qat'i, okay? But it's still not 100% Qat'i, but it's pretty close. Uh, Okay, so uh, so there's Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and the changing of the days, and you can divide them into Qat'i, where the text is Qat'i about it, where the text is Vanni about it. I'll give you an example. At the level of Islam, I gave you the example of the Witr prayer, for example, or I gave you the example of Sulqarnain, or uh, things, I gave you some examples. Now, at the level of Imaniyat, in terms of the text. The Quran says to believe in the angels. Now, let's say there's a hadith that talks about some angel, some specific angel. Uh, yes, it could be related to that, about Isa alayhi doing that. So anyway, so let's say there's a certain specific angel, the, uh, Harut and Marut, or some angel, specific angel. If a person says, I believe in the angels, but I don't believe in this specific angel because the hadith is weak, is he still Muslim? Tell me. Yes, he's still Muslim. 
So if there's a dispute about, so it becomes a matter of the, the imaniyat, Islam, and ihsan, and all of these two can be divided into these two categories. What is absolute and what is it that I'm thinking? Now, when we start our thinking process together, and I start saying, like Sheikh Amran Hussain has an opinion, and then I also listen to that, and I'll start also agreeing with that opinion. And then another scholar starts agreeing with that opinion. And you have a few scholars or a bunch of scholars or 40, 50 scholars who start agreeing with Sheikh Amran Hussain. What is now happening to that idea? What is happening? From an Islamic perspective, it is becoming an ijma. It is getting scholars underneath one agreement, right? And so you have a growing consensus of many of the ideas of Sheikh Imran Hussain. It's getting closer to absolute, right? But it will always start with what? One or two people who will be sidelined. They will have an opinion. They will use their mind. It will not be something qatai. It will probably be something vanni, or at least to the people. And then those people being sidelined so sooner and later find their own ideas becoming mainstream and accepted by the majority. Um, and so uh, this is another aspect that needs to be kept in mind. That when you have, for example, somebody who claims I'm a prophet or I'm this or I know this and I know that. And if, you, if that person is sincere, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will carry that person's ideas forward. Okay. I know in my own lifetime, something I witnessed myself, that people used to make fun of Dr. Isra Ahmed Rahmatullah in our lifetime when we were his students. And today the whole world listens to his lectures after he's passed away. So this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. Many of the great scholars we read today, they were made fun of in their time. They were sidelined in their own lifetime. They, they couldn't have imagined maybe that somebody would read their books the way that we read them now, you know, because they were completely sidelined. So anyway, that's, that's a separate issue. So coming back to the issue of um, the difference between Islam, Iman. So when you're talking with each other, be very careful of what you call haram. Be very, be, know that, yes, this is my opinion. I'm 100% firm on it, but I still have to take a step back. Why? Because it's not qatari. It's not to treat your own opinions and to have, and worse than that, okay? First mistake is to treat your opinions as equal to what is clear in the Quran. That's a mistake. <coughs> you should not be vaccinated. That is my firm opinion, okay? So now, there should be a clear distinction between what Allah said and what are my thoughts. And then, that's the first mistake is when you start thinking your thoughts and the Quranic words are the same. They're not the same. So what is qata'i versus what is vanni? Number two, when you start becoming impressed by your opinion that you dislike it to, a, a, to the point that you become overly angry when somebody disagrees with you on your opinion. So that's even worse to have ta'ajjub, like think, oh, what a great opinion I have, or I'm special because I have this opinion, or we're special because we have a special understanding of certain issues that other people don't have. Yes, alhamdulillah, we are special in many ways, but also in some ways, we're not special. So, because every group has its special T's and special understanding and so on and so forth. So the point I'm trying to make here is to not confuse what is absolute from what is our opinions. Yes, I believe we're living in the last age. Yes, I feel that the Dajjal has taken over the whole world. And yes, I feel vaccines are bad and that Bill Gates has a, this whole thing that we've been talking about. But you have to be able to step back and say, okay, but Quran is leading me. 
So I have to always take a step back and always be able to re-examine my opinion. Always be able to re-examine, just like in fiqh. I may have one opinion. I may have the opinion that, I'm just saying, this is not true. I'm just saying, I, I may have the opinion that, uh, you know, that before you start Fatiha in Salah, you have to say, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem. Then later on, I read something else and I came to a different understanding and I said, well, you don't have to, but it's better if you do. Okay. Okay. Again, uh, if someone says all the minor signs have taken place, is that a qat'i statement or a dhanni statement? Tell me. Dhanni. The, the place of the intellect, because people are talking about the intellect, the place of the intellect will always be in dhanni. Always will be dhanni. I'll give you an example, just so that you properly understand this. The fuqaha have a difference of opinion. Because they, why do they have a difference of opinion? Because the issue is qat'i or dhanni? Dhanni. But it's still valid. Meaning, whatever the different opinions are, they're still valid opinions. But they're dhanni. <coughs> So it's very important to make this distinction. It's very important not to jump and call something haram. It's very important to understand the difference between Islam, Iman. Ihsan is what? Ihsan is the struggle to open those realities that really exist, like opening the curtains from this reality to the next reality while you're living in this world. And they have a different rules and regulations. Different rules. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Oh, uh, stages of Islam, inshallah, one day I will discuss. But let's just for now, just keep it very simple. That the rules of Islam, the rules of Iman. So what happens is, somebody's Iman is high. And he says to the other person that, uh, oh, astaghfirullah, you wasted the food. Wasting food is bad. It could be a sin. But let's say somebody who has a lot of iman and a lot of taqwa, he says to the other person, you uh, wasted the food. Okay. At the level of iman, he may be correct to some degree. Okay, but at the level of Islam, it's, uh, you can say, not a valid even topic. Okay, I'm not talking about wasting like the way Quran says people waste and in al mubazirina kana ikhwana shayateen. Those waste and are wasteful are the brothers of shaitan. Not in that sense, but I'm, I, I was thinking in my head, like some, like for example, there are people, I, Sheikh Isra Ahmed, my teacher, he was one of them. I've seen my own with my own eyes that if he used a napkin on one side, for example, he wouldn't waste, he wouldn't just throw it away. He'd use the napkin on the other side. When we used to write in books long time ago, in the early you know, 90s and the late 80s, when we used to write in our books, our teachers would be mad. Why'd you miss a page? Right on the back of the page. You know, if you wrote on the front of the page, write on the back of the page. This is how they were. They felt it's being wasteful. But being wasteful is, is, is it's more from an Imaniyat perspective than from a, uh, a Sharia perspective proper. Okay? Even though there's some overlap, you can say. Ihsan are the different stages that are required to come to closer to Allah, to become the friend of Allah. How do you become the friend of Allah? There's a whole subject in itself. It has different rules and regulations. To have that are different from Islam, that have to do that are somebody can be very close to Allah, and his iman, his tasdik, his confirmation of iman is not very strong, but he's become very close to Allah. 
Another person can have absolute 100% proof that this is the truth. And he's not made his journey of becoming the friend of Allah. You see? And so you have Islam, which is the external. Iman, confirming that this is the truth. And then the journey of becoming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is Ihsan. These are three different things. And sometimes when uh, in this journey, these things become confusing. But you have to make it clear. Okay. Um, what about the signs of the Day of Judgment? What is the purpose of the signs of the Day of Judgment? Okay, so as far as changing of the days is concerned, what are the rules that apply there? I will only say that, again, just like Islam, Iman, Ihsan, they have a different set of rules. And one of the reasons that people have a hard time dealing with the opinions of somebody who has studied Islamic eschatology all their life is that they haven't spent the time in understanding the rules of how, what is it, what is the Islamic concept of history? What is the Islamic concept of how things are going to unfold? So a, mo a lot of our scholars have spent a lot of time understanding Islam and its rules and regulations and what is qata'i and what is dhanni and what is haram and makru and all the different various fields, whether it is hunting or whether it is, uh, you know, how to do zabiha and praying and wudu. And we've done a lot of that in the field of Islam. And then we've done a lot in the field of Iman. This is where the Ashari or Multadariya and all of this, and also in how to become close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the field that is also now needed in addition to these three in the end times is now to understand the rules and regulations of how time changes things. What are the principles of how time, time changes? Why is time moving in this direction? What is the, what they call the teleological concept of Islam? Where, where are things going? Where will they end? What is the final end of history? So to say, right? And so the prophet told us that the history is going to move in a certain direction. What are the principles that undermine that? Right? What are the principles that undermine that? And one of the things that I'll leave you with for today about the tayyirat al ayyam. What is that history is trying to do? History is trying to do two things. Number one, history is trying to prove or history is looking for, uh, you can say, history is, is a battle between haq and batil, a battle between the truth and falsehood. That's what history is. History is the, is the forces of evil against the forces of good. And understanding the principles of how the forces of good and how the forces of evil work. And then it is, in, in terms of the good, it is the History is looking again, is looking again to reestablish the Islamic, is re reestablish the uh, Islam on the earth and on the globe, is what the history is looking for, is the direction history is moving in. But in the middle of this is the hurdle we call the Jal or the end times or the Fitans that we're passing through this, right? So this, the Ghayyarat al Ayyam, for example, the Prophet said, every 20 years, history will change. The, things will change every 20 years. This is what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every 20 years, things will change. Okay, so every 20 years, things are changing. Things are changing. Look about, look at how the world was 20 years ago to how where the world is today. When I was young, there was no internet. Then when I was in my 20s, there was the internet. Now we're after another 20, when I was in my 40s, we got blockchain and this new technologies of gene therapy and everything else that is emerging now. Every 20 years, things are changing. Next 20 years, the world will be a different place, right? Than where it is today. And so this is, this is the understanding how the world is changing and understanding how the forces of evil and 
haq, the truth and falsehood are colliding into one another and affecting that change. And so with that, uh, if anyone has specific questions about what I wanted to talk about, the difference between Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and the changing of the days, or the Tagayrat, or the Alam of the Sa'a, the signs of the hour. Okay. So if anyone has specific questions for that, I'll inshallah answer. Otherwise, inshallah, we're done for today. Yeah, changing of the days. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Islam is the truth. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent to all of humanity. Prophet Muhammad was sent to all of humanity. And so therefore, that mission of the Prophet has to be completed. That is the purpose of history. History exists to, for example, if a group of people, if a group of people, the Prophet tells them to believe and they don't believe, if a group of people don't believe in the Prophet, what does history do to them? What does history do to, if you don't agree with the Prophet? You're finished. Nu, Lut, so on and so forth, Saleh, right? You disagree with the Prophet, you're taken away from the earth. Prophet Muhammad was sent to all of humanity. His purpose of coming here is to establish the Hujja, is to establish the excuse upon humanity, to show humanity. And that is the purpose of history, is to bring the message of the Prophet to all of humanity and to establish Islam as the way of life over all of humanity. And that is one of the reasons Isa Islam is coming back. Ihsan is the stages you go through to become the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so I hope this was helpful to all of you in terms of how you should look at things and categorize things. This was the most important point that I wanted to make is how you should look at things and how you should categorize things. That what is qat'i and what is dhanni. So next time when you're talking to someone and they say something and say, okay, yes, I agree with you, but it's still dhanni. I agree with you, but it's still dhanni. Or I agree, I disagree with you, and it is dhanni. Right? So these are tools to help you categorize. You could be abs you can be absolutely right. And and still, but it's your thought. And never, ever, 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 ever become proud or impressed with your own thinking. Never become proud. Don't ever have ujub. Uh, oh, what a, you know, I'm so smart. These people can't even figure out the vaccine, that it's a terrible thing. And these people can't figure out, you know, it's obviously the end times. And these people, no, never, ever, ever, ever be like that. Astaghfirullah, never be like that. Never think you're better than other beca others because of the gift Allah has given you. Never. So we should, you know, we should thank Allah for the guidance Allah has given us. We should thank Allah that Allah has clarified many things for us that he's not clarified for many other Muslims. And we should pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear to others. And that we should always still in our back of our minds, just like the Hanafis, they will say, we think we're right, but it's possible the Malikis are right. And the Malikis will say, we think we're right, we're 100% right, but it's possible the Shafis are right. The Shafis will say, we think we're right, but there's also a possibility that what Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal is right, the Hanbali Fiqh is right. So the same way here, I am 100% sure I am right, right? But even though I think I'm right, it's also possible I'm wrong. This is to put your own thoughts in its proper place, that your thoughts are not equal to Quran, they're not equal to the Sunnah of the Prophet, okay? Uh, your thoughts are not, your thoughts are your thoughts. They may be right, they may be wrong, but they need to be put in the right place. If you do this, then inshallah ta'ala, Allah will guide us even more, especially if you have shukr. 
And when you say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, when you say salams to the Prophet, think about the ni'mah of Islam that he brought to you and say shukr for that, that the Prophet did his job, his best, that he could, he did it for us. And then say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad with that feeling, you know. And always make a distinction and never just jump and say, oh, that's haram. Because that's a very serious word and a very, very serious term. So, inshallah, I'll end here. 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 Inshall